Conrad's grandfather, Conrad Roy Sr., had called the police station and said, I have the pin code for his phone if you guys need to get in. So now they had the password to get into Conrad's phone. And when Detective Gordon went into the messaging app, he noticed that all the messages were gone, except for one conversation thread between Conrad and Michelle Carter. He read some of the messages and he thought, something's not right here. There is something not right. So he sent the phone off to have it basically delved deeper into, to have everything pulled off that they could. And he called the district attorney's office and he said, do we have something here? Like, what can we do about this? And that's when they began investigating Michelle Carter, who is at this point cozying up to Conrad's family, who is posting pictures of Conrad on her Facebook page, writing about how he was the best thing that ever happened to her, literally screaming for attention. Poor me, my boyfriend died. Poor me, please comfort me, please pay attention to me. On Monday, July 21st, Detective Gordon went to Lynn Roy's home and asked her if Conrad had any access to computers at the home. And Lynn said he did, that there was two computers in the home that he would use. So Detective Gordon did take those computers. This is also when Lynn Roy informed Detective Gordon that there had been a suicide note left in a notebook for Michelle. And Detective Gordon was like, I'll take that, thank you very much. It's okay though, because Lynn had already read the note to Michelle over the phone, but Michelle was really desperate to get her hands on that note. You know, she wanted proof that before Conrad died, he'd thought of her. So, you know, she was always texting Conrad's mother and saying like, can I get that note yet? Can I get that note? And Conrad's mother would say, oh, the police have it. They say they need it because they're looking into his death. So I don't know why they need it, but they need it. There was a wake and a funeral for Conrad, obviously, and Michelle attended both. And when she found out that Conrad had been cremated, she asked Conrad's family for a portion of the ashes. She also asked Lynn Roy if she could go through Conrad's room and take some of his things to remember him by. So at this point, Conrad's family is starting to be like, this girl is thirsty. She's coming on a little hard, right? She's really like trying to insert herself into our own personal family mourning. At the funeral, Michelle pushed her way to the front so she could stand with Conrad's family and she proceeded to make a big show of herself and a big spectacle of crying and sobbing and holding on to Conrad's mother for support. On July 26th, Michelle texts Lynn Roy and says she wants to organize a baseball softball tournament in Conrad's memory, which will be called Homers for Conrad. And she wants to do this to raise money and awareness for suicide and people who are victims of suicide. She creates a Facebook event for Homers for Conrad. And the funny thing is she's making this event for Conrad, it's called Homers for Conrad, but she's making it in her hometown of Plainville, not where Conrad lived, not where his family and friends were, but where Michelle's family and friends were. Is that weird? Conrad's friend, Tom, this was his best friend. This is the one he was planning to go to college with and a room with. Well, he saw the event on Facebook in August and he saw that it was created by this person named Michelle Carter and he'd never heard of Michelle Carter. Now this is Conrad's best friend. He's never heard of Michelle Carter. So he's like, who is this chick? And why is she organizing this tournament for Conrad in some like town an hour away? So he reaches out to her on Facebook and he pretty much asks her that. He's like, you know, who are you? And like, why is this happening so far away from where Conrad lived and grew up? And she's like, oh, I'm dating Conrad, or I was, I was dating Conrad, and you know, we loved each other, so. So she tells him, you know, this is what I'm doing, I'd love you to be a part of it, blah, 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 and he's like, okay. And she gives him her phone number so he can text her if he has questions, and he does text her. He texts her on August 26th, 2014, and he says, hey, Michelle, it's Tom. How are you creating brackets and everything? And she responds and says, hey, so yeah, I don't really know yet. And Tom asks her, what time will it start? I just want to know because I'm going to create a Facebook event too. And she responds to him, just share mine. Ha ha, I don't know what time it will start yet. It depends how many teams we get. He responded to her, expect a lot. Ha ha. She goes, yay, I'm so happy. Are you going to share mine? And he goes, I might just make my own because I know a lot of people that you don't. I feel like it would work a little bit better. And she responds to him, okay, ha ha, good idea. Are you going to mention me in it? And he's like, yeah, of course. And she says, okay, thank you. So then he asks her, just curious, how long did you and Conrad date for? 
And she says, we were dating on and off for like three years, haha. <laughs> but he asked me out again on June 11th, so we were dating for like a month this time around. And he goes, I had no idea. She goes, haha, ha, I'm not surprised. I don't think he told anyone. Tom asks her then, why is it in Plainville? And she responds, it's my town, haha. Ha. And he goes, but everyone that knows Conrad is from the Mattapoisett area, dot, dot, dot. She goes, yeah, I know, but I didn't know how to organize it in a town I didn't know anyone in. And it was a long drive to keep going back and forth. Tom offers to uh, make some calls and he says it makes more sense to have it in Mattapoisett. And she goes, yeah, I'm sorry, I was gonna have it there, but I know everyone here and I know how I can advertise and everything here. I know people will come anyways from your town though. He goes, I understand, but you're the only person from Plainville that he knew. I feel like it would be so much easier for his family and friends to have it closer to home. And she goes, I know what you're saying and I agree. I'm sorry, but I really don't think I would have been able to do it there because it would have been really hard for me to organize, you know? And he goes, I can organize it. And she responds, well, the one I'm doing is going to be here because I already have it all set up. Haha. <laughs> but you can do one there another time, like next week or something. And he says, I'm going to contact the Mattapoisett Little League because it's going to be way easier for all Conrad's family and friends to attend in his hometown. I know it's what he'd want. I would love to have you attend as well. If you could change your event's location, that would be great. And she's like, Tom, I can't change it. Like, I already have it made here, and I have people advertising it here and supporting it and everything. I'm sorry, but it has to be here. Like, I'm sure everyone will come from your town. It's only 40 minutes away, and it's a fundraiser for him, so I know people will come. Like, this was my idea. I created it to be here. Ha ha. He said, I understand. Just curious, how many times did you meet him in person? So Tom is coming for her hard. He knows something's fishy about this girl. And she says... Why are you asking me all these questions? He goes, just curious because we were so close, but he never mentioned you. Not trying to sound messed up or anything. She responds to Tom and says, I know what we had and he does too. He was the most special and important person in my life and he told me the same. He told me everything about why he killed himself and all that he was feeling. We were endgame. We both knew it. He didn't need to tell anyone that. I'm so happy he had a friend like you though, Tom. He really loved you. You know what you guys had. I'm not going to pretend like I knew your friendship, but I just know it was special. Hold on, I'm, I'm getting heated, I'm getting heated now. So then Tom tells her, you know, he's creating his own event post because more people know him so they'll see it and then they can go to the place in Plainville where she's having it and she says to him, I'm not kidding, this is real. This is what she says to him. Okay, awesome, thank you. You're not taking credit for my idea, right, lol? And he goes, no, I'll credit you if you really want. And she goes, ha ha, well, I mean, I'm hosting it like it's my idea, but you're like my co-captain now. And she wants to make sure that when his friend shares it on Facebook, he gives her credit for creating it and coming up with the idea. Does that sound like somebody who's really concerned with suicide awareness? Does that sound like somebody who's doing it for the right reasons or somebody who's doing it for attention? Steal my idea, make sure you give me credit. Like, I can't even believe she felt comfortable saying that. Homer's for gone, Rad, Your Honor, in September. She and Ta, uh, uh, Tom Gamble get into it where he says, why is it in Plainville? He didn't live there. I planned it. Don't take credit for my idea. He's dead, Your Honor. This is his best friend and she's mad because he's going to try to take credit for he, uh, her idea because if it's in another town, she's not going to know everyone. If she's not in charge, People won't see her as the grieving girlfriend. Conrad's father lets Detective Gordon know about Homer's for Conrad, and Detective Gordon sends another officer there to observe, and they also wanted to make sure that the phone number that was under Michelle Carter's number in Conrad's phone was actually her phone number, that it wasn't just somebody else he was talking to who you know he'd written Michelle Carter under. Basically, they could not wrap their heads around how this normal-looking girl could have done and said the things that Michelle said to Conrad. They couldn't wrap their head around it, so they had to make sure. So the guy goes to observe her and he says, you know, she's in her element, basically. She's extremely happy and extremely good spirits. She's surrounded by people who are basically there to support her, you know, all her friends and the sports team from her school and the teachers and all the whole town came out to support Michelle who lost her boyfriend. So she's in a very good mood. She's very pleased with herself, but they do call the number to see if she picks it up, which she does, so it's her phone and now they know. And at this point, the Fairhaven Police Department haven't given Conrad's family any indication that they think Michelle might have been involved. They're keeping that to themselves for now. But at this point, they knew 
that Michelle and Conrad had maintained contact right up until the point that he died. So they were like, we gotta find out more about this girl. They got a search warrant for her phone and her computers and they went to school where they found her in the gym to speak to her and let her know because they needed her phone. And they actually recorded this conversation and you can tell in the beginning, she has no clue why they're there. She's just playing a game, you know, she's like, tried so hard to save him. I've never tried to save anybody so hard in my whole life, but I just couldn't do it. And they're like, hey, did you talk to him that day at all? And she's like, no, no. And then they're like, okay, well, we have a warrant for your phone, so we're going to need that. And then she's like, what? What? You need my phone? They're like, yeah, we have a warrant. We need your phone. So she gives them her phone. And then her father, who's waiting outside, they all drive back, Michelle, her dad, and the police officers, they drive back to Michelle's house where they sit down and have a conversation with Michelle and her parents who are extremely helpful and cooperative. Like they hand over the computer that Michelle would use at the home and they give the detectives the code to Michelle's phone. So they don't know what the heck's going on. They don't think their daughter did anything wrong. So they have no problem cooperating at this point. But the cell phone and the computer provided the detectives with the proof and the evidence that they needed to actually arrest Michelle in connection with Conrad Roy's death. Now let me tell you about some other texting conversations that they found in this phone with other people. And I, I swear to God, I can't make this stuff up. It's going to blow your mind. This girl had some serious issues. Okay, so first we have Allie Ethier. She was a camp counselor during the summer of 2014 and Michelle volunteered at that camp. Before July of 2014, Allie and Michelle had never communicated personally. They had just been involved in group chats and group texts with other camp counselors and other volunteers. But in July, Michelle actually texted Allie personally. This was July 12th, 2014, the day that Conrad died. Michelle texted Allie and she was like surprised because Michelle had never texted her before, but she responded. At some point in this conversation, she asks Allie, do you know, do you have a boyfriend? And Allie's like, yeah, you know, I did, but it didn't work out. And then Michelle's like, yeah, I get that about it not working out. You know, like I have a boyfriend too, but he's got some serious problems right now. You know, it's like really bad. She says to Allie, the past few days, he's really been scaring me, you know, talking about like committing suicide and now he's not answering back and I'm so worried. This conversation with Allie literally happened after Michelle was on the phone with Conrad when he killed himself. On July 13th at 7.01 p.m., she texts Allie and says, he's dead, he committed suicide. Then she proceeds to allow Allie to comfort her. Within the weeks following Conrad's suicide, she continues to reach out to Allie, trying to get her to talk to her and hang out with her. She's like trying to follow her on all her social media platforms. Like, what's your handle, you know, on Twitter? Like, what's your Snapchat? She's generally just being incredibly thirsty and Allie's, you know, kind of responding very distantly, very minimally, and Michelle just keeps going. She literally even texted her to ask her, did you like my Snapchats? If you have to text somebody to ask them if they liked your Snapchats, they're not looking at your Snapchats. She would just keep asking her, do you wanna hang out? Do you wanna get ice cream? Do you wanna go to Six Flags? Do you wanna come over? I nominated you for the ice bucket challenge. You have 24 hours to do it. And Allie keeps making excuses, you know, like I'm working, I'm busy, I can't come over and Michelle keeps trying. On August 15th, she even asks Allie, like, I have a question, do I text you too much? And Allie's like, no, not really, but you know, I'm just really busy, so I'm not always like on my phone. And at one point, Allie literally has to tell Michelle, like, you talk about Conrad's death a lot, and I get it, like, it's upsetting to you, but it makes me uncomfortable, so because that's what would happen. Every time Michelle felt like Ellie was pulling away or wasn't talking to her, she would bring up being devastated over Conrad. And when, when Michelle Carter began texting you on or about July 12, 2014, how would you describe your relationship with her at that time? I didn't know her very well at all. At that particular time, other than camp-related activities, had you ever spent time with Michelle Carter? No. So when she began to text you on July 12, 2014, what was your reaction? Um, I was kind of surprised. When Ms. Carter tells you her boyfriend committed suicide, how many days have you been talking to her? Um, only a handful of that. Olivia Masalgo was another person that Michelle forced her friendship on. They used to play softball together, but they didn't really hang out outside of softball. Michelle would complain to her that she didn't have any friends and nobody wanted to hang out with her. We were friends in the sense that I was there for her when she was going through things and 
but not every day, like best friends would or anything. Would you go on weekends, would you hang out with her? No, not really. At school, would you hang out with her? I would see her at school. And You'd see her, but would you hang out with her? There wasn't really much hanging out at school okay. for me. Would you call her up to go to her house at all? Not much. And so you would primarily see her at softball events or in the school hallways? Yes. Now, when you were back at high school with Michelle, uh, is it fair to say that she expressed to you that she felt like she had no friends? Yes. Oh, mm. wow. Yes. And did she send text, message, text messages to you about that? Yes. I'm going to point your attention to a particular text. Can you read that to us, please? Mm -hmm. No, stop, I'm not. Stop telling me how wonderful and beautiful I am and how I'm such a funny girl because beautiful girls get invited to parties and their friends call and want to hang out. They don't spend Friday nights alone and funny girls don't lock themselves in their room to cry. And now um, on that same day, 6.33, could you read that for us, please? Livy, I have, like, no friends. No one hangs out with me. And at 6.40, 15 seconds. I'm alone all the time. And would you actually, um, at that time, would, did you ever go to her house or on weekends, or did you hang around with her outside of school? Again, yeah, no, mostly for, if this was junior year, then not much. She told Olivia she was often alone, and sometimes she would lock herself in her room at night and cry. There's all these texts where Michelle's like, I'm fat, I hate how I look, and Olivia's like, no, you're beautiful, you're fine. And then Michelle will be like, thank you. And then later she'll be like, I'm so fat, I hate myself. And Olivia will be like, no, you're fine. Like, we all have a friend like this, right? We all have a friend like this, and it gets exhausting. She texted Olivia on July 13th to tell her Conrad had committed suicide. And then on July 20th, she writes, he told me he was gonna do it soon and stuff. I just never believed him because every night when he said he was gonna do it, he didn't. So that night when he actually did it, I couldn't believe it. I was talking to him on the phone when he killed himself, Liv. I heard him die. I just wish I got him more help. I wish I would have called someone to stop him that night. He would have probably did it a different night, but at least I would have got more time with him. At the end of the day, I just really miss him. He was who I talked to until 3 a.m. and now he's just gone. But his mom called me today. She found a suicide letter he wrote to me. He didn't write one to anyone else. His mom said I was the most important person in his life. So to know that just means so much to me. His mom never said Michelle was the most important person in Conrad's life. They didn't even know she existed. They didn't even know she was dating Conrad. His family literally like, had met her once. His friends didn't even know she was on the planet. No way did Conrad's mom say, Michelle, you were the most important person to Conrad. And she's saying and admitting in text message, she was on the phone with him. She was on the phone with him when he died. Even though when the police questioned her months later, she would say, I didn't talk to him all day. Next, we have Lexi Ablen. Lexi and Michelle, they went to school together. Lexi called their friendship an in-school friendship. Basically, they would sometimes text each other a few times during the week, but Lexi wasn't really seeking out to hang out with Michelle. Where Miss Carter began to text you about something you found to be concerning. Yes. And what type of things were she, was she texting you that you found to be concerning? Um, like personal problems. What was your relationship like with the defendant when junior year is ending? Um, I would say mostly just texting. I don't, I never really hung out too much. And at that, as school is ending, was, uh, were there any talks between you and Michelle or you, Michelle, and Sam about doing things over the summer? Um, I believe Michelle asked us, but I'm not sure if we had any plans. Did, in your mind, did you have any plans to hang out with her over the summer? Not really. However, Michelle would constantly ask Lexi and Lexi's best friend, Sam, to do things with her. Hang out. What are you guys doing? Are you busy? Let's hang out. We should hang out. Sam and Lexi always made up excuses, said they had to work or they had other plans. They didn't really want to hang out with Michelle because she was so needy. In the spring of 2014, Michelle began to confide to Lexi that she had been cutting herself and she was struggling with psychological issues, but Lexi claims she never saw any of these scars or abrasions from Michelle cutting herself, so. Was there ever, during this time frame again, when she was asking to hang out and you guys weren't, that she talked about the term cutting? I believe so, yes. And at your age, being in high school, was there some, did the term cutting mean something to you? What did you think that that meant? Um, like cutting your wrists or your body to self-harm. When you were seeing Ms. Carter in school after the couple of times she said she was cutting, did you ever actually see any wounds on her? No. On July 4th, Michelle had Sam 
and Lexi come over and spend the night at her house. They had a sleepover. I don't know how she, you know, roped them into doing that, but they slept over her house that night. It was a Wednesday. And what was your initial response to Michelle when she asked you about sleeping over? Um, I don't recall. I don't think I really wanted to, but I ended up sleeping over. And who else was going to be sleeping over with you? Sam. And who made the initial plans to sleep over the defendant's house, you or Sam? I think Sam did. At that time, were you and Sam still best friends and spending a lot of time together? Yes. On July 10th, Michelle sent Lexi this message. Thank you so much for coming over and hanging out with me, Lexi. It really made me happy. You and Sam are the only people who actually make me forget I have an issue and stuff for a while. And like, you guys make me feel normal. I can't thank you enough for that. I hope you want to hang again sometime soon. I had a good time and I hope you did too. Lexi did not respond to this message as she would often not respond to Michelle's many messages. So after about 20 minutes of seeing that Lexi hasn't responded to her message, Michelle must have been like, hmm, what can I say? to get attention and get a response to my text message. So then she texts, Conrad's missing. They can't find him anywhere. Now this is July 10th. This is days before Conrad actually went missing. Lexi responds back the next morning. Did they find him? And Michelle responds right away. Thanks for asking, not yet. I'm losing all hope that he's still alive. She then goes on to tell Lexi that Conrad has been missing since July 4th when they had their sleepover. She says, yes, he's been missing since Wednesday night when you guys slept over. He hasn't called or talked to me or anyone since. I just don't understand. He didn't even tell me like we were supposed to hang out today and he knew that. Then on July 12th, she texts Lexi and says, he called me and I heard like muffled sounds and some type of motor running. And it was like that for 20 minutes and he wouldn't answer. I think he killed himself. He told me that day he went to the store to get a generator for work. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but on the phone, I heard a motor running, which I think was the generator. I just looked it up online and it said they are dangerous and fatal because they give off carbon monoxide. You can die within 20 minutes with that thing. I think he poisoned himself and it's all my fault. I'm so stupid. I should have known that's what he was doing. I'm so effing stupid. I don't even know what to do. And then of course, you know, she gets what she wants. Lexi's like, Michelle, you're not stupid. It's not your fault. You know, what else is she supposed to say, right? What else is she supposed to say to this girl who's literally like saying she's responsible for the death of this kid and you know, she thinks she heard him die. So days before Conrad actually went missing and killed himself, Michelle's texting Lexi and saying he's been missing since the sleepover at her house. She doesn't know where he is. And then the night that he actually does kill himself, she texts Lexi and says, I think I was on the phone with him when he did it. On 721, July 21st, she texts Lexi and says this, I'm going to Conrad's tomorrow to go through some of his things with his mom and to get a suicide letter that he wrote to me. I know Sam wants to see it and stuff, so maybe we can do something Thursday if you're free or Friday. Lexi responds, he wrote you a suicide note? And she goes, yeah, he did. And only for me, his mom found it. And Lexi says, that's amazing. She goes, yeah, it just means so much to me to know that I was that special to him. His mom said I was the most important person in his life. If you want to read it, when I get it, you can. You and Sam are the only people I want to read it. I doubt it. I guarantee you if she'd gotten her hands on that note, she would have posted it on Facebook. Did you want to read the suicide note? I don't think I really cared too much. In August of 2014, Michelle tells Lexi she still has feelings for this Alice girl, right? This Alice girl from before, and that she thinks she's bisexual. And she asks Lexi if she's okay with that. And Lexi's like, yeah, whatever, I don't care. And Michelle's like, thank you so much for accepting me. And then she goes on to tell Lexi in the text messages, do you know Allie? Um, she's a counselor at this camp I volunteer at. I think I like her, like I have feelings for her. She then continues all month to get Lexi to hang out with her or try to get Lexi to hang out with her, always asking like, are you free? Can you come over? Can I come over? Can we see each other? What are you doing? What are you doing? At this point, senior year, would she still have been asking you and Sam, and um, not asking what Sam told you, would you know yourself via text message or in person with Michelle or over the phone, was Michelle still asking you guys to hang out? Yes. And were you hanging out with her? No. And then at the end of August, she texts Lexi, hey, I just made the Facebook page for Homers for Conrad. I'm like famous now, LOL, go check it out. Next up is Sam Boardman, Lexi's best friend. Michelle reached out to her in the spring of 2014 asking for help with her eating disorder. Now Sam says she didn't wanna get really too involved, but she also felt bad and she wanted to at least make sure Michelle was eating breakfast or had healthy eating options. Can you tell us sort of the beginning months of your friendship, uh, March, April of 2014, so sort of the second half of the school year, what were, the, what were your conversations predominantly about when you first started talking with her? 
Um, so predominantly it was uh, about probably about like food intake or because I, I think she really reached out to me particularly or I noticed you know if she needed help with um, you know any kind of eating disorder that she was going through so I think it was basically um, just trying to reach out for help in that sense or I didn't want to get too involved in it um, like on daily day to day um, I just tried to help her make sure she ate a breakfast because you know I can see if people you know get hangry or whatnot but um, basically just making sure that she's you know doing what she should be doing as as far as just basically getting to eat. Were you ever seeing her outside of school in any sort of social way at all? Not at that point, no. Things you were telling her that maybe might be a good idea, were there ever times when you felt as though you were getting frustrated? Yes. And did you express that to her? Yes. He said, I wanted to help you, but you have your mind set on what you're going to do. Like, even when you say you're going to do it my, my way, you know in your head you aren't. You also know that you need to eat and that eating just fruit isn't right. I've tried and honestly, I don't know what you want me to do anymore. There's no point in me telling you to do stuff or trying to help when you don't listen anyways. Sam said that Michelle would text her incessantly and would get upset or paranoid if she didn't answer. Uh, are there times during the academic school year, or during these thousands of text messages, where there were times when the defendant would text you and you would be late or take a while for you to text back? Yes. And would she sometimes, the defendant, react to that? Yes. And what, how would her reaction be if you took a long time to respond to her? She would often repeatedly, repeatedly texted me until I responded, I was able to respond. What would you generally describe sometimes to be the length of the defendant's text messages to you? Very lengthy. The same story here, right? Michelle telling Sam that she's friendless, nobody wants to hang out with her, nobody ever asks her to hang out, she always has to make the first move, she's so sad, so lonely. Yeah, I have school friends that all say they love me, but that doesn't mean shit when it no one ever asks to hang out with me. No one ever calls me or texts me. It's always me that has to do it. So when someone actually makes an effort to talk to me and hang out and stuff, it makes me so happy and I actually feel important, like I'm worth something. I don't even remember the last time someone asked to hang out with me before you did. But I don't IDK what I was thinking. I knew I was just going to make it all come crashing down. I always do. I feel like that's what's happening now, and it's always my fault. I can't believe anyone else. It lasts for a few weeks or months, and then that's it. I push people away. I text them too much or try talking to them too much, and they leave. Every single one, and then I'm left crying in bed at night because I have no one, no friends, barely a family. Like, they don't even like me half the time. Michelle also texted Sam on July 10th. Um, thanking her for the sleepover and saying they all need to hang out. She then texted her later that day saying he's missing. He always texts me in the morning, but he didn't today. She said he talked about getting a generator at work. She was afraid he was going to kill himself with it. Now, once again, Michelle's texting Sam saying Conrad is missing, but this is while he's not missing. Conrad is actually texting her at this exact same time saying he's upset that the generator he got from his dad's shop that he was going to use to kill himself wasn't working and she was like go to Home Depot and buy a new one. As she's telling Sam and Lexi that Conrad's missing and she's worried he's going to kill himself. At 8.02 p.m. the night of July 12th when Conrad killed himself, Michelle texted Sam Boardman at 8.02, literally three minutes after she hung up with Conrad. She said, Sam, he just called me and there was a loud noise like a motor and I heard moaning like someone who was in pain and he wouldn't answer when I said his name. I stayed on the phone for like 20 minutes and that's all I heard. I think he just killed himself. I'm so effing stupid. The generator he got the other day, I think that was the noise I heard. I just looked it up. They emit carbon monoxide. I think he poisoned himself with it and it's all my fault because I should have known he was going to do it and I should have stopped him. I keep trying to call and there's no answer. I think he did it. I don't even know what to do right now. So Sam was at work and she didn't text Michelle back right away. She didn't actually even respond until 1.30 p.m. the next day and she told Michelle not to worry. It will be okay. He didn't kill himself. And at 3.50, Michelle texts her and says, can we do something tonight to get my mind off of it? I'm worried my boyfriend killed himself and I was on the phone with him when he did it. 
You wanna hang out? Sam doesn't respond, and roughly three hours later, Michelle texts her again, saying she just talked to Conrad's sister and he killed himself. Then she keeps asking Sam, can you talk on the phone? Can you come over? I can't even function right now. I don't know what to do. And Sam's like, I mean, I'm sorry this happened, but I'm kind of busy right now. Like, I can't, I can't come over. I'm working. I have stuff to do. And Michelle keeps pushing for the attention. She spends the next couple of weeks just playing the victim with Sam, trying to get her to hang out, asking, can she come over? I really need help. I really need somebody. And on July 21st, Michelle texts Sam this. I just got off the phone with Conrad's mom about 20 minutes ago, and she told me that detectives had come to go through his things and stuff. It's something they have to do with suicides and homicides. And she said they have to go through his phone and see if anyone encouraged him to do it on texts and stuff. Sam, they read my messages with him, I'm done. His family will hate me and I could go to jail. Sam responds, don't worry about it, Michelle. They will see that you are his closest friend and that you were there for him and loved him. They will see how he was gonna do it despite what others said. Additionally, they wouldn't tell his family if you were to encourage him unless it was really bad, like bullying, which it was the opposite of, right? Right? Right, Michelle? Michelle says, yeah, that's what I'm hoping. Like, I hope they see that he had his mind set on it. Like, it may seem like I wanted him to, but I didn't at all, you know? I loved him. Like, I read this thing online where it said, if you agree with the person, then it makes them realize how stupid they're being, and they'll stop. But if it didn't work, and I just, I don't know. I hope the cops can see it that way. Like, I didn't bully him. On September 15th, Michelle seals her fate with another text to Sam Boardman. Sam, his death is my fault. Like, honestly, I could have stopped him. I was on the phone with him, and he got out of the car because it was working, and he got scared. And I effing told him to get back in. I knew he would do it all over again the next day, and I couldn't have him live the way he was living anymore. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't let him. So now we know, right? Michelle was on the phone with Conrad when he was trying to kill himself. And when he probably started to feel nauseous and lightheaded and knew he was losing consciousness, he got out of the truck. He wanted to live. He got out of the truck. He wanted to live. And she said, get your ass back in that truck. Don't be a baby. You promised me. You said you were going to do this. I knew you were all talk. Get back in there and finish this. After Conrad died, Michelle called his phone dozens of times that night. She also texted him constantly in the days after his death. On July 16th, sweet dreams, babe. I know you're up there smiling down on me. I'll always smile back. I love you forever. On July 19th, I just went to your funeral. It was beautiful. Your uncle made a wonderful and heartfelt eulogy about you. He talked about all the good times and memories and then mentioned how you were struggling at some points. We all knew you needed help. And I'm so sorry I didn't do enough. I'm sorry I let you do this. I should have stopped you. I miss you so much. I wish you could have seen how many people loved and cared about you. Maybe then you'd still be here. I told your mom I would come over and hang out with Camden and Morgan. I'll do that soon. I also went to Kmart and put flowers in a shell down at your memorial because we first met in Florida. And your life was the ocean, so I thought it was nice. Read the message I wrote on it today. I said goodbye to you, but it wasn't forever. I love you so much. I'm smiling up at you. Do you see me? You're my guardian angel. I know you're smiling back like you always said. On July 30th, Haha, ha, did you see me struggling on that hike today? I gotta get back in shape. I'm gonna do it for me and you. I love you and miss you every day. I'm looking up at the stars, do you see? On August 18th, today has been one month since you passed. It was a hard day for all of us. I hope you were looking down with a smile. I just hope you're finally happy, babe. I miss you more and more each day. I love you. Michelle was arrested and indicted on February 5th, 2017 on the charge of involuntary manslaughter. And she was charged as a youthful offender, which is basically a step up from a juvenile. In Massachusetts, if you are under the age of 18, but you do something that you know, seems pretty horrific like this, they can charge you as a youthful offender instead of a juvenile. But it pisses me off a little bit, right? Involuntary manslaughter. Involuntary manslaughter is like something you didn't mean to do. Like um, I was texting in my car and I accidentally hit somebody and killed them. That's involuntary manslaughter. I made the decision to text while I was driving, but I didn't expect to kill somebody and I didn't want to kill somebody. Involuntary manslaughter suggested something she didn't mean to do. And I think she did mean to do it. I would say, and I don't know if you agree with me, let me know, but it seems pretty clear that 
she wanted him to kill himself. In June of 2017, she opted for a bench trial, which basically means she waived her right to a jury trial. In the bench trial, the judge is going to be like judge and jury. The judge is gonna make the decision on whether or not she's guilty or innocent. He's gonna decide what the sentencing is, everything. The reason that Michelle and her legal team decided to do this, I think, was because they knew how horrible it was what she did they knew that the cops had all her texts all her correspondence with conrad and his family and all her friends and when put in front of a jury 12 normal people would feel like i feel disgusted by this absolutely horrified by this and they thought because there was really no law saying you can't tell somebody to kill themselves they thought they'd have a better luck with a judge who would abide by the law instead of you know, functioning on an emotional level, but they were wrong. In her trial, her defense team said Michelle was a victim. She was struggling with her own mental issues. She was weak-minded. She had her own things going on and Conrad basically used her to help him commit suicide, that he was the driving force, that he was the dominant one in the relationship and he manipulated her and took advantage of her weakened mental state. There is a long, continuous plan of intentions by Mr. Roy to take his own life. Sadly, that he did not think hospitalization would work for him. He did not want hospitalization. You will see in the records in August of 2013, he actually refuses to be brought in, in uh, inpatient. He does not, paint, uh, uh, patient refuses. You'll see in the records that his mother said, I don't think he can wait a week, but he refused in any event during that time. This is somebody who wanted to eventually take his own life. It was his decision. He chose to get in that car. He chose to breathe in the fumes. Despite the speech of Michelle Carter telling him, I thought you were going to do this, I thought you had plans to, you will never see Mr. Carter pick up the phone. The evidence nowhere shows in this case, Your Honor. They picked up the phone and called 911 or blocked her call, simply the block call feature. There's nothing like that. He chose to continuously communicate with Michelle Carter. Even after the time that she changed from, I want to save you, go to McLean Hospital, you will see that even when she advocates, encourages him to complete his plan, he doesn't tell her, stop this, don't call me, lose my number, stop texting me, block call, nothing of the like. He continues to use her for his support to carry out his plan. That is obvious in this evidence, Your Honor. Dr. Bregan, Michelle's psychiatrist, testified that in July of 2014, Michelle was involuntarily intoxicated by her medication. She was psychotic, deluded, and out of touch. The prosecutors were not buying this, of course, so they said Michelle was going to camp. She was hanging out with her friends. She was texting her friends, talking to them all the time. She was regularly seeing a therapist, but she was psychotic. How was she able to do all this stuff, but she was psychotic? How was she seeing a therapist regularly and the therapist didn't pick up on the fact that she was psychotic? And Dr. Reagan was like, no, I mean, she was like, you know, delusional. And the prosecutor was like, but you said she was psychotic. There's a difference between being psychotic and deluded. So which one was it? So they basically grilled him a little bit. But you would agree with me, sir, at the time you were testifying, she was involuntarily intoxicated. She was the under, under the treatment of a therapist, correct? Yes. And you didn't even try, you didn't even call that therapist? No. Now, you would agree with me, though, you're, you're talking about all of these relationships the defendant had. She herself complained that no one ever wanted to hang out with her and nobody liked her. Yes, she's welcome to adolescence. Well, sir. And also, I think that she had that, that sense even more than most, but more than most, she reached out to try to fill that emptiness that she felt, the vulnerability. She reached out, and she reached out mostly in good, kind ways. Sir, she would send, you would agree with me that her text tended to be extremely long, correct? That she sent to these people, her friends. No, the, oh no, the, real, the only really very long texts, I believe, are from Conrad to her talking for pages about how miserable he is. I don't know of any very long texts right. from her. Maybe there's one or two, but Sir. the longest ones in there, they're Conrad's. 
she very, very, very much is in need of making contact and engaging people. But it's around real stuff, and she helps people feel better. Sir, as I said, isn't it true that at some point or another, most of these girls tell her to back off and to stop? No. No? I think I, maybe I missed it. I can only remember like two, one or two. One or two girls? I'm not, yes. I'm talking about the girls that she's just texting with. I'm not talking about... Oh, but in general, sir, how many girls are you aware of that told her to back off or she wasn't supposed to contact? No, that's a different matter. Objection, Your Honor. Well, as to his awareness of other people, I will allow his awareness. Thank you. Do you have any such awareness, Doctor? Yes, I have an awareness that at least two girls asked her to not relate to them anymore. It wasn't particularly around just the texts. It was a relationship. Right. They didn't want to have a relationship with him. So two outside of text messages, you know of at least two girls who told the defendant that not to contact them anymore. Yeah, and they were separated in time. And I asked you during cross-examination about whether or not she was depressed, and you testified, isn't it true, that the defendant had no signs of depression for the two years leading up to death. Yes, I did. I was uh, actually quite mistaken. I found out after the voir dire, the involuntary intoxication is a legal concept. Right. The but involuntary it's not in the DSM. and is not in the DSM. Right. Next question. What are you diagnosing her with that is in the DSM? Because you referenced the DSM in your report. Well, she has, basically it's a substance. And do, if I were to go in the direction of just looking at the psychiatric diagnosis, it would be the substance-induced mood disorder with SSRIs. Okay, great. If you could find the criteria for that in the DSM-5, so we can go over it, please. Well, that's in different places. Um, one place one would go is to mania. And you would agree with me that the therapist describes her appearance as good eye contact, well-groomed, correct? Okay. Yeah. All right. Short-term yeah. memory intact, judgment good, correct? Mm-hmm. Behavior, no abnormalities, correct? Yeah. Her affect is appropriate. Her long-term memory is intact, correct? Yeah. Her insight is good, correct? Yeah. Risk of self-harm, none. Risk of violence, none, correct? Yeah, well, that, that's her it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Her attitude is cooperative and pleasant, and her thoughts logical, correct? Yes. All right. And she's oriented to person, place, and time. Yes. And you're now telling us that she didn't know right from wrong at that same time. Well, actually, she thought she was doing absolutely the right thing. But this is how she always appears to adults, and this is why I didn't have the information that was in her texting with her friends, and in particular with Conrad. Yep. This is how she always looks. That's why I got fooled. They also pointed out that in March, Dr. Breggins had basically diagnosed Michelle as mentally sane, like she was fine. And he only changed his diagnosis two weeks before the trial. Now the prosecution suggested what I believe to be true, is that Michelle basically pushed Conrad to kill himself because she wanted the attention that would come from being the girlfriend of somebody who committed suicide. The school year had ended, so she wasn't seeing these girls all day during school. She wanted them to hang out with her, and they were not hanging out with her. She texts her friends, oh my God, he left me a note. His mother said I was the most important person in his life. He only left me a note. She texts that to Sam, Lexi, and possibly others. Why would she say that? She wants their attention. She wants to feel like she was the one, that they were, you know, going to be together forever. Poor her, her boyfriend died, they were going to get married one day, and now she's the grieving girlfriend. She was using his death as an opportunity to get the attention that she so badly wanted, and in fact got. So she concocted this plan, basically. She was probably like, you know, he wants to do it anyways, so I'm just going to let him, and then I'll use that to gain attention and to gain friends, to gain people who will want to help me and be there for me. On July 4th, Michelle asked Conrad to tag her in a tweet that would be his last tweet so that her friends would see it. She also asked him to leave only one suicide note for her. She wanted people to think she was more important to him than she actually was. She wanted people to see her as the biggest part of his life, somebody who had worked so hard and tried so hard to save him and the biggest victim of the whole tragedy. The judge deliberated and he announced his verdict. 
At first, it seemed like he was gonna rule in favor of Michelle. Then he flipped the script and he was like, but she told him to get back in the car. There is a duty to take reasonable steps to alleviate the risk. The reckless failure to fulfill this duty can result in a charge of manslaughter. Knowing that Mr. Roy is in the truck, knowing the condition of the truck, knowing, or at least having a state of mind, that 15 minutes would pass, Ms. Carter takes no action in the furtherance of the duty that she has created by instructing Mr. Roy to get back into the truck. She admits in a subsequent text that she did nothing. She did not call the police or her or Mr. Roy's family. She knew his location, again, according to a text that she sent, as being at the Kmart Plaza. And finally, she did not issue a simple additional instruction. Get out of the truck. Consequently, this court has found that the Commonwealth has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Ms. Carter's actions and also her failure to act where she had a self-created duty to Mr. Roy since she had put him into that toxic environment constituted each and all wanted and reckless conduct. And this court further finds that the Commonwealth has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that said conduct caused the death of Mr. Roy. And she cried while the verdict was being given. The judge also allowed Michelle to remain free on bail until her sentencing hearing, which was on August 3rd, 2017, where she was sentenced to 15 months in jail. Her lawyer pleaded with the judge to allow her to stay out of prison while they appealed it, because they were gonna appeal it to the Supreme Court. And when they did appeal to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court upheld the judge's decision. On February 6th, 2019, just this month, the Massachusetts Supreme Court upheld the ruling and Michelle Carter is now serving her sentence in prison. So what do you guys think about this? There have been a lot of people who say this is uh, an issue for First Amendment rights. You know, you should be able to say whatever you want. But that's not necessarily true, right? Because not all speech is protected. Hate speech isn't protected. Is a person telling another person to kill themselves not even, you know, in a mean way, like go kill yourself, but literally saying like, you know, you're going to be better off. You're going to be happier. You're going to be at peace now. Like lulling them into this sense of security that they're thinking suicide will bring. Is that protected under free speech? Is that protected under the first amendment? In Massachusetts, assisted suicide isn't legal. So why would this be? Why would anybody think that Michelle Carter should have gotten off with no punishment? She told him to get back in the car. To anybody who thinks that you can't or shouldn't be held accountable for the words you say that cause other people's actions, I would ask you to look at the case of Charles Manson. Charles Manson never killed a single person with his own hands. He told his family to do it. But Charles Manson died in prison. He spent the rest of his life in prison for the deaths that his words caused. Words can hurt. Words can cause somebody to do something they might not have done. I truly believe that Conrad could have gotten better. Is there a chance that Conrad Roy would have gone on and still ended his life? Yes, there's also a chance that he would have gotten help. There's also a chance that he would have gotten himself out of this dark spot he was in and gone on to live a very happy life. He could have gone on to, you know, go to school for four years and get married and have children and take over his family business and then teach his sons and his daughters how to run the family business. He could have had a very, very happy life. He might have struggled with mental illness forever, he might have always had to have participated in therapy and kept up on his medication, but he could have been okay. So the actions of one young girl who was starved for attention, who had gone for so long getting attention by being a victim, by being somebody who used her mental illness as a way to basically have people feel sorry for her because she felt comfortable being the victim. She felt like that was the only way anybody would pay attention to her or give her attention or hang out with her is if she was a victim and she was damaged and broken and people felt sorry for her. She had gone so long doing that and people were kind of like over it at this point. They were like, 
we don't really want to hang out with you because all you do is talk about how you're sick and you're cutting yourself and your eating disorder. It's getting old. She needed something else to be the victim about. So she talked her boyfriend into killing himself so she could use that for attention for herself. And I think it's pretty clear that you guys can see how I feel about this. I think honestly 15 months is too short of a sentence. I think she should have gotten a much longer sentence and I think that would have sent a message to people out there who think it's okay to bully people on the internet, who think it's okay to tell people go kill yourself or you're worthless, nobody likes you, you should just end your life. There's no reason to do those things or say those things. So maybe those kinds of words shouldn't be protected under free speech. Maybe those kinds of things should be considered legitimate threats. The First Amendment shouldn't give people free reign to just go ahead and manipulate and control whoever they want, especially if they know they're in a weak mental state and a weak emotional state, to manipulate them to do whatever they want, to kill themselves for their own benefit. So I think it's good she's serving time. I hope it makes the next person who wants to do something like she did think twice before engaging in that kind of disgusting behavior. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let me know if you think Michelle was in the right at all. Let me know if you think she should have gotten off and not gotten any time, or let me know if you think she should have gotten more time. And try to be polite. Please remember that there is a family out there who lost their son, and there is another family out there who lost their daughter. Because honestly, her life's pretty much never gonna be the same. So we have to really be sensitive. There are families out there whose children are involved in this and we wanna be respectful and we don't wanna say anything that would cause them any more pain than they've already faced in their life. Okay guys, let me know what you think. I can't wait to hear, unless my comments get completely blacked out again. And I will see you guys on Friday and then there will be a new Mystery Monday on Monday. Stay kind and stay beautiful. I love you guys. I feel in my bones Like a blaze of fire dancing in the cold Oh, at the rhythm of the sun well, I was wide awake until the dawn upon her face And the echoes of our song as it hummed along Saying everything is gonna work out fine And all the hopes we have will fall in line Cause love will take all our pain away So stay with me, stay with me I need you